we're honored today on our uh, Global Health Research Seminar Series to have Dr. Will Ngawa, um, uh, Wilfred Ngawa. He, he says, please call me Will, so I will. <laughs> Thanks, Will. And um, uh, he's going to be talking here as, as shown the, the premier comprehensive cancer center in the cloud, C4, powered by AI. But if I could uh, give a quick introduction to Will, um, he's a faculty member at John Hopkins Medicine, where he's a distinguished professor of public health at the Institute for Clinical Translational Research and an associate professor of radiation oncology. Uh, he's also director of the Global Health Catalyst, uh, launched at Harvard Radcliffe Institute Summit in 2015, dedicated to catalyzing high impact international collaborations to increase access to cancer care research and education. Uh, Dr. Ngawa has held faculty appointments at Harvard, guest professorships at the University of Pennsylvania, um, don't hold that against him, and the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Uh, he currently chairs the Lancet Oncology Commission for Cancer Control in Sub-Saharan Africa. He's published three books on global health and radiation oncology and over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles across the prominent journals as you, uh, if you go through his CV. He's on the editorial board of um, ASCO's Journal of Global Oncology and Frontiers in Oncology and is the lead editor of the IOP Science Publishing Series on Global Health. So Will, um, thank you. I guess that wasn't so brief. It's hard to give you a brief introduction, but uh, please take it over and then hopefully leave time for questions and comments if people don't jump in also while you present. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Rick. Uh, and thank you everyone for, uh, the opportunity for inviting me to give this uh, talk and um, for taking time off of your Friday afternoon, you know, to do that. Uh, so yeah, the title of my talk is going to be the Comprehensive Cancer Center in the Cloud, powered by artificial intelligence. And I and I just it's a really um, concept that we launched during the Global Health Catalyst Summits that you know um, really leaves a lot of imagination, and we're kind of innovating as we're going along. Um, but I always want to start by, you know, let me just make sure. Yeah. So I always want to start by talking about the problem um, that gets me up each day. And I think for, for most of you uh, in oncology as well, you know, um, you know, this is, this is the rising global burden of cancer. We know uh, currently, according to the World Health Organization, that we have over 18.1 million new cancer case, cases a year. Um, almost 10 million deaths per year. Uh, and this data that I show you on the right left hand side, right hand side here is actually uh, from the Lancet Oncology Commission uh, that I chair that has a very recent data on Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. And uh, what you see there essentially is that, um, you know, the projections are over a million, you know, cancer deaths, you know, by 2040, which is really, um, you know, shocking statistic there. Um, there's also a huge amount of disparities. So actually over 60% of the cancer incidents and 70% of the deaths are in low and middle income countries. Um, and this, this graphic here uh, from the IAEA really exemplifies, exemplifies one of the um, disparities that we know. Uh, so obviously with the background in radiation oncology, um, you know, this is one of those. If you look at this map, uh, you see all the red spots that you see there. Uh, that's where you may have um, almost no uh, radiation, uh, radiation oncology treatment facility. And you can see that most of those are in uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and also in Southeast Asia. Um, and it turns out if you match that with the fact that, you know, 60 to 70% of the cancer incidents and uh, mortality is in low and mid-income countries, you can see why right away. Um, uh, there was a very interesting article in the BBC, uh, British Broadcasting Corporation News, um, that do US docs have better access to radiation therapy than Nigerians? And it was a very provocative article, um, but reading through it, you know, you, you, you are shocked that the answer is actually yes, um, you know, 
that that's the big problem, you know, uh, just because of the location where you are born, um, you don't have access to cancer treatment. Uh, even more shocking is when you think about children, right? So in the, in the United States, we know 80% of this uh, can be cured. In Africa, for example, you less than 20%. Um, and so for kids, you know, being diagnosed with cancer is tantamount to, uh, to death, essentially. Um, and you can see across from radiation oncology to chemotherapy. Uh, this map I also got from the Lancet uh, Commission that we do, uh, kind of looking at these red spots where you may not even have in a pediatric oncology services. Um, and the other problem, you know, just kind of highlight this again, this picture was in the New York Times uh, a couple of years back um, about uh, Brenda who, who is in Uganda and um, East Africa. And, um, you know, she has this really, um, you know, awesome looking cancer and on her face, but because of in the village, people look at that and they think she's bewitched, you know? Uh, so she doesn't only have to deal with the cancer, she has to deal with the trauma of the fact that, um, you know, people think she's a witch. Uh, and so, you know, that's the cultural, um, you know, and system, the background that can really uh, make the, the burden even worse. Um, but I always want to think about, you know, when you think about global health, you know, global health is local health. And so even though we highlight, I highlight the disparities across in, um, out, of, out of the United States, you also have a huge disparity level in the United States, just in our neighborhoods, uh, right, right in New Jersey. Uh, you can probably point out a, number of, a lot of neighborhoods that have um, those kind of disparities. Uh, so one of the shocking ones you can think about is the fact that just for prostate cancer, um, you know, 3.5 times more deaths uh, or, you know, for, for African-American populations. Um, if you breast cancer, you know, for people who are living over 50, um, you know, for women who are over 50, that's twice. Um, and again, this becomes an issue where um, this is not, this is not due to, um, you know, this is just because of racial disparities. And so there's this huge magnitude of cancer disparities that needs to be addressed. Um, and so how do we do that? Um, the way I usually view this is, um, you know, I like my kids love, love the Avengers movies. Um, and so I usually look at these statistics of cancer and I look at them as uh, the monster Thanos who basically gets up one day and decides that he's gonna wipe out 50% of the world's population. And, um, and so the, the very famous uh, Avengers movie series you know, you have the Avengers working to make, working together to, uh, to fight back. Um, and it required collaboration. So basically you had all the Avengers working together. And I think it really captures essentially what we need to do uh, to address uh, disparities and also not just disparities, but the growing burden of cancer. Um, and underline win-win collaborations because um, that's the only way you can have collaborations that are sustainable uh, to address these disparities. President Biden just launched, relaunched, uh, reignited the cancer moonshot a couple of weeks back. Um, and so, you know, one of the key things there obviously, obviously is equity, but um, also there's a big need for collaborations across, uh, you know, people from different stakeholders, you know, industry, uh, all scientists, academic uh, institutions, uh, you know, and, 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 and advocates, you know, so, um, but, you know, for Africa and lower mid income countries, I kind of look at it as a ground shot instead of a moon shot, because uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, evidence based uh, interventions that are already out here uh, that if we can implement those can really make a huge difference. Uh, and so, you know, uh, we can actually really stay grounded here. Um, so, you know, I've been directing the Global Health Catalyst uh, program uh, since 2015. And one of the things that we've always checked with people is what are some of the barriers to collaborations uh, in addressing disparities, especially in global health? Um, and what keep coming, keeps coming up a lot is the idea of that we have these distance time barriers, um, you know, cultural barriers, and of course, funding uh, or financing of this. And I'm going to address, so the cancer center in the cloud really focuses on addressing, you know, the distance, distance time barriers. Um, and so, but 
you know, I just want to highlight this graphic as well because I know in the United States, you know, um, these are the barriers to addressing uh, health equity. Uh, call them the great barriers. So geography, race, income uh, or earnings, um, attitude, which I also called culture, and of course technology, which has become uh, one of the big things concerns during the corona coronavirus pandemic because. People talk about the fact that, you know, depending on your neighborhood, if you don't have broadband internet, um, you know, even the online classes and all of those things can lead to a digital divide. Um, so, um, so these great barriers, I'm just gonna address in particular, the geography and the cultural ones. And I think these are big uh, in terms of how we can um, uh, eliminate cancer disparities. Uh, so as we celebrate Black History Month, you know, one of the things that I think captures um, the essence of this is what, you know, Martin Luther King uh, kind of highlighted in his dream, you know, kind of repurposing that to say, we have a dream that one day cancer can be eradicated uh, and everybody will have access to quality health care. Um, and to do that, you know, one of the solutions to address the distance time barriers, uh, we think can be these, imagining this comprehensive cancer center in the club, which, um, you know, can allow or facilitate collaborations that can address these disparities. Uh, I just want to, you know, as I think about this uh, cancer center in the cloud, to picture this as a phone where you have four apps on it. You know, uh, the, the apps are basically the care app, the research app, the education app, and an outreach app. And, you know, what I'm going to do for the rest of my talk is kind of highlighting how, you know, um, we already have all the tools uh, to be able to implement this um, and also highlight examples of things that we've already been doing in implementing these tools on the under the C4 uh, to address disparities. And I want to highlight, for example, that uh, under the education app, you know, we already have an online global oncology university initiative, which really sets, I'm going to talk about that in a moment, which really sets addresses the issue of, of education and training. Um, you know, and then we have a care app. And you can imagine this. This was very, uh, has increased significantly during the coronavirus pandemic, telehealth. And so you can imagine teleoncology as well, uh, obviously with, you know, the assistance of artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, in oncology departments, we have two more boards, you know, those, those can be handled uh, on Zoom. Second opinion, remotely, remote treatment planning and quality assurance support. Uh, and you can go on and on. Uh, of the uh, potential uh, interventions that we can do now using using the cloud, essentially. Uh, on the research, you know, uh, there's a lot of ongoing multi-center clinical trials that, you know, basically leverage technology, information and communication technologies. Uh, outreach, you know, working with industry. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite is thinking about how, you know, as you think about brain drain, which is a huge issue, how you can turn that around. Uh, turn brain drain into brain, brain circulation, essentially, because it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can be able to contribute to this. So um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of examples. Uh, I mentioned the Global Oncology University. So just kind of highlighting an example where we actually use uh, online to um, education training uh, here through this uh, C4 uh, to be able to train over the past three years, you know, over 1,100 oncology health professionals, and specifically not just giving online lectures, but actually including practical training that you can do from their computers. And in this example here, um, you know, basically you have an image of a patient that they have to learn the anatomy of that and actually contour. So map out the regions that have cancer and regions that are healthy tissue so that as we do treatment planning for a radiation oncology, you know, radiation oncology, uh, we can target the cancer and spare the healthy tissue. And so uh, we use a platform, a, a tool called Prono. Um, and, and I just wanna explain how this actually works. So with this model, uh, what happens is that you can, uh, on, you can get up on a Saturday morning, even just in your PJs, and you, people can dedicate one to two hours of their time uh, and in this case, we had faculty who are experts in, you know, head and neck cancers or cervical cancer or prostate cancer, 
uh, just commit two hours of their time on a Saturday morning, and then you know we'll provide this platform for them to help to teach um, you know people all over the world can have access you know to the best you know who have who are experts in these areas. Um, but in addition to that, they had these tools that they can actually uh, do this mapping, uh, contour, and then um, you know the, the faculty, the, the invited professors can can grade that. And over time, you know, the experts, these experts create um, data that can be used by artificial intelligence. Uh, and so now you actually have artificial intelligence basically grading people when they, when they train. So they can just go on there, they can contour and um, AI, you know, the expert can just match that with, um, with expert expert contours, and they can see where their misses are. So the, the, the red regions that you see here would be the the missed, the missed uh, contours. And then, um, you know, the, the extra places that are contoured and then the, the, the blue parts will be the parts where, um, um, or the, ex, the missing parts will be the blue parts and then the extra parts that are contoured are actually the red parts, which you don't want uh, to treat. And so this becomes a really effective um, approach to address some of the, uh, just highlighting and where you can, train, you can train people more, even from a distance. Um, and I just want to highlight these examples, why this is so important. Uh, actually, one of the Lancet studies that happened in 2015 kind of highlighted this great need for, um, you know, training of radiation oncologies, uh, radiation therapies, medical physicists, and something like that. And, and these, these numbers are really um, staggering. You know, these are numbers that need to be uh, really addressed. And so in this program that we did uh, over the Global Oncology University platform, I just want to show you some data uh, where in this case you had this, uh, this, this we actually uh, had a pre-class quiz or, you know, testing of the, the trainees and then a post-class assessment to quantify the change in their skills, improvement in skills level afterwards. And uh, what we see here essentially is that there's a significant, I mean, there's a jump in overall in all the different things that uh, they were trained on uh, to the blue blue level. Uh, so this is really good. It was good news for me when I saw this, um, but it was also bad news. Uh, the good news, the good part of this was that, you know, we definitely made a difference for these uh, oncologists uh, in low and middle income countries, you know. But, you know, on the other hand, I couldn't help asking myself, you know, what have they been doing so far with their patients? Uh, it was very clear and evident that they needed these additional training. Uh, but it also reflects the fact that, you know, if you don't train them well, uh, the patients are gonna suffer. Um, and so, you know, we've grown this program over the past three years to include partnerships with the European Society of Surgical Oncology, provided uh, surgical courses, training courses, the African Organization for Research and Training in Cancer uh, and other professional societies. And we actually have a new course coming up from April uh, that's gonna run to July. Um, that's really gonna be very helpful in hypofractionated radiation therapy. Uh, and I wanna talk about that um, a little bit later as one way that you can really increase access to cancer patients. Um, but then think beyond education, you can think about care as well. As I mentioned, Daily oncology is a huge deal now. Uh, second opinion, remote treatment planning, and, and quality assurance support, um, and other telehealth uh, approaches that can support. Um, and so we actually have, through this network, the C4 now, over 600 oncology health professionals, including our diaspora, African diaspora, low and mid income country diaspora oncologists who are willing to help uh, provide this kind of tele oncology services. Um, but it's not just in treatment, um, you know, the idea that it can use artificial intelligence and ICT, so information and communication technologies, uh, can also be, you know, used for cervical cancer or other, um, you know, other, you know, you can use that for diagnostics as well, you know. And this one example here shows, you know, a, you know, a study in, um, in Kenya that kind of highlights how, you know, you can um, essentially use technology uh, to be able to uh, do screening for for, uh, for for cervical cancer. So where there are limited number of pathologies, you can analyze the test results and artificial intelligence has been trained to be able to uh, allow you know, um, a diagnosis even remotely. 
And so this becomes one of the, just highlights another example where you can use, um, you know, artificial intelligence or technology. Um, the other area uh, worth highlighting is in research, obviously. So um, in research, like I mentioned, we already have a number of tools that we can use. And one of the very effective approaches we've seen so far is the idea of co-mentored research collaborations, where uh, we've been providing very small seed grants funding, like you know $5,000 grants that can support and these are being provided by over a hundred diaspora organizations that we have partnerships with. Um, so they can provide $5,000 grants um, and um, you know, they can be used to support uh, to seed research in, in by a low and middle income country uh, scientist or researcher who is co-mentored by a faculty in a low and middle income country and a faculty in the United States. Um, and so this through this co-mentorship, you know, they get to generate some preliminary data that they can then use even for either to publish, or they actually can present that at a conference. So most of them present that during our annual Global Health Catalyst Summits. Um, and then they can develop that into a publication and maybe use that to apply for grants. So through this way, the Global Health Catalyst Program can really catalyze collaborations um, also in research. But in this way, most of these, uh, the faculty that are collaborating are usually uh, from a distance, right? So there's a distance time barrier. So, but what we know now is that through technology, you can really make those distances, uh, just like me now giving this talk from remotely, you know? So um, there's really great opportunity here to be able to uh, leverage technology to facilitate research collaborations. Uh, and then one that I wanna highlight again is the multi-center clinical trials. We currently have, um, two that have been started, uh, one that's ongoing right now uh, that involves, you know, um, oncologists in the Ocean Road Cancer Center in Tanzania and also in the Lutsia uh, in Center in Lagos. Um, and now we just had a third uh, site from South Africa in Durban join these multi-center clinical trials. And what we do here, we basically use technology to make the credential these sites to make sure that the same protocols for clinical trials are being followed in each of these sites. And then we can remotely monitor and help support in the quality assurance. Actually, we do that now on every, every Saturday. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock, we get online with all these different sites to make sure that um, uh, you know, the data that they're collecting, we can collect. We actually have a platform to collect the data for the clinical trials, and we can also support them remotely. And so um, this is a start of um, a number of uh, multi-center clinical trials that we want to implement. We just got notice to fund for one of those uh, clinical trials that's going to involve from NIH that's going to involve multi-center clinical trials, um, you know, combining radiation therapy and immunotherapy. Uh, and we expect that uh, the grant plan is to start that, you know, by the end of this year. Um, so now we, you know, have to move that through the FDA, get the approval, and they're going to use the same, the same, the same, uh, uh, you know, IRB in their own local institutions to start that trial. Uh, but all of, a lot of that can be developed using the, we actually have the NIH funded quality assurance review center, which you may be familiar with, that can help, um, you know, um, monitor these multi-center clinical trials. And that is an example of a tool that we've integrated in the cancer center in the cloud, essentially, uh, for driving research. Um, so yeah, as I promised, I actually want to share this, something that's close to my heart. We're actually including this in the Lancet Commission uh, action uh, one of the action calls to action. Uh, so over the coronavirus period, we realized of your, because of the restrictions um, that um, you know one of the approaches that can be uh, adopted, you know, is hypofractionated radiation therapy. Um, you know, it can substantially reduce the treatment time and cost, enhance patient convenience, and we actually show that it can increase access to care by over four hundred percent and reduce disparities both in the United States and also in Africa. So in this paper, we actually uh, did the analysis for United States and also for Africa, African countries. And uh, it will save billions of dollars in Africa. Um, i just give you an example for prostate cancer. We actually see that uh, currently if you use conventional treatment, um, you know, the patients have to come in 35 to 40 times to get their treatment. Uh, but with this hypo, which means reduced fractions, uh, uh, clinical trials now show that you know you can get non-inferior outcomes even with 
you know, six fractions. Uh, I just talked to somebody in California yesterday who says they're actually using uh, four fractions now, uh, you know, and if you can think about that for a lower middle income country setting, it means that uh, the time you take to treat one patient who has come in 35 times, um, you can use that to treat, you know, five patients who have to come in, you know, just seven times. Um, and so that's a huge deal for most of these lower middle income countries because they only have, like Cameroon where I was born, you know, they have one radiation therapy machine serving a country of over 22 million people. Um, you know, so that people travel long distances have to wait for weeks to get into treatment. So you can already see where the 400% is coming from right away, you know, because, um, you know, you can really allow many more patients to be treated. Obviously, these were recommendations that came out during the COVID-19 a lot more because they didn't want patients to be coming in a lot. So all the NCCN guidelines and the American Society of Radiation Oncology, all those people, the, the, the national, you know, they, 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 they recommend it. Uh, such, you know, uh, hyperfractionated radiation therapy approaches because they can really reduce treatment time and cost and um, the number of times the patients have to come in. Uh, that's true for prostate cancer, but it's also true for breast cancer. Um, and these are actually the leading cancers, causes of cancer deaths, uh, I mean, in the United States, but also in, 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 in Africa and other low and middle income countries. Um, so, and then the last item I want to point out, you know, it's uh, for the Comprehensive Cancer Center in the cloud is the outreach. Uh, so we deliberately include outreach because um, when we started running the Global Health Catalyst Summits, and you know, we used to always be cancer health professionals uh, who were invited and they talked to each other. And then we began to realize that, you know, for this to be sustained, and especially in low and mid income countries as well, where, um, you know, most of the, the, the budgets and things like that come from the Ministry of Health, from policymakers. Um, you know, we have to engage them. We have to engage them. A very good example is how to engage the, engage the, the government, the US government on the cancer moonshot. Uh, so we began to reach out and invite, you know, policymakers, industry, uh, you know, to participate in this. Um, and so uh, one of the peak, uh, the big parts of the C4, uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center in the Cloud, is our outreach component, which, um, involves uh, organizing these yearly Global Health Catalyst Summits. Um, we just got NIH funding for this, to fund this over the next years. Um, and uh, while NIH says we need to organize this in different locations, uh, initially it was at Harvard Medical School, but now the one we did in November actually was done online completely. Um, and uh, we plan the next one now would be in July, seven to nine, uh, it's gonna be hybrid. Um, because as we hopefully as coronavirus gets better, um, you know, we can get more people. We have recognized that, you know, for you to have collaborations, which I mentioned is one of the solutions here, um, you know, really meeting people face to face uh, makes a tremendous difference. Uh, there are a lot of things you can do remotely, uh, but it's also important to have that. But that online component is really important because it then provides access. More people can actually participate um, and you can engage more. So, um, so this is one of the, the big aspects of the, the other app in the C4, is really the outreach component. And I would like to highlight the other one, which is the component, what this allowed us to do is really engaging um, in the outreach diaspora organizations. Right now we have over 150 diaspora organizations, African diaspora organizations um, in the United States that are supporting this. And they're the ones, some of these that are providing micro grants to seed funding. Uh, for this. They have budgets, you know, these are basically uh, organizations that have budgets and uh, they can allocate some of those, uh, that funding, you know, to support, um, to see these kind of collaborations. And so through this, we can really turn brain drain to brain circulation. Uh, some of them are participating in the, in the other apps, you know, uh, the care, you know, the research as mentors, mentors uh, and education, which anybody can do. Um, you know, like I mentioned, you can just get up on a Saturday morning and you can do that uh, if you, uh, if anybody's interested in doing that. And so, uh, but I'd like to end by talking a little bit about where in highlighting some areas where artificial intelligence really becomes a big part. Um, so, um, you know, you know artificial the, the big problems obviously in low and mid income countries are, for example, the limited access to high quality care. Uh, I've highlighted the idea of the work workforce strategies that we have. 
the equipment you start out with a radiotherapy machine and the breakdown of this equipment is a big deal uh drugs limited access to essential medicines um you know the data uh, collection practices even uh cancer registries these are big issues that can really help with this kind of data uh, you can use that to uh, even for artificial intelligence. But where artificial intelligence can really help in these different areas is obviously um, you can develop low cost devices that can increase access to care. I just highlighted the example for the, uh, the, the app that helps with cancer screening or diagnostics in, in Kenya. You can do that remotely uh, where there's shortage of health, healthcare workers. Um, and so we also see that it can assist a lot of the oncologists in lower and middle income countries who work in silos. There may be, uh, actually the culture is such that, and some of them have confessed this, right? So they come out of medical school, they're residents, uh, and they are dealing with a complex case. Instead of asking more like in the United States where we have more disciplinary care, uh, asking your colleagues about what can be done, um, they are actually, the culture is usually that if you go and ask another person, they'll ask, what did you, what did you learn in medical school? Uh, and, and so they are afraid, they work in silos. And obviously if you work in silos, you can guess who suffers. Uh, in this case, you have the patient suffering. And so my first funding that I actually got for this AI was with, uh, with IBM. Uh, IBM actually supported, you know, developing these, um, you know, assistants that can help, you know, some of these, some of these doctors uh, in clinical decision support, you know, because instead of them just working in silos, at least they can get suggestions if you put in you know, the information of a patient, they can give you recommendations of the possible treatments that you should consider. Uh, maybe they're just reinforcing what you want, like a second opinion. Uh, obviously you don't have to take them, but at least you're having some additional feedback uh, and not working in silos. Um, one of the areas we're highly recommending in the cancer, in the Lancet Commission is the cancer registries, of course. Once you get this um, information and communication technology set up, uh, artificial intelligence can really help, you know, um, with, you know, it opens up a lot of research opportunities. Uh, and so uh, very excited about this. Um, I want to highlight this example where we've actually applied, we apply artificial intelligence um, in, in uh, identifying and contouring, identifying, you know, um, you know, where, where in during radiation therapy treatment planning, you know, so in the first case, you, you train the AI, and then when you get a new patient, um, you know, it can automatically look for the areas that you already drawn. Um, and so this can really assist, um, you know, doctors in lower middle income countries. And um, so that's a really useful um, application. And so, you know, to kind of summarize, you know, I think the comprehensive cancer center in the cloud is really about access. You know, it doesn't matter where you are in terms of your geography, whether you're in a low and middle income country or you're in a poor neighborhood in, uh, in uh, in New Jersey or in New York or, or Baltimore, um, you know, you can be able to have access, um, you know, especially for addressing disparities. We already have interventions that we know work. Uh, and the problem is how do you get people to access that? There are cultural barriers, there are geographic barriers, there are infrastructure barriers, um, you know, using technologies like information and communication technologies, um, you know, can really help address that. And so we can envision, imagine a future where you can have a cancer center in the cloud, comprehensive cancer center in the cloud, where people can access that from anywhere. Um, and, and, and obviously this is, a, you know, this is something that's gonna keep growing and improving and refining. And so in terms of the next steps, we're actually looking at implementation research on this, you know. Um, you know, it's not a one size fit all. Like we know, even in global health, uh, the, the, the worst thing is when you just think that, okay, I have a solution, uh, I'm just gonna go and apply it anywhere and it's gonna work. Um, you know, because of the cultural factors, the systems, you really have to carry out the implementation research. Um, and like I said, global health is local health. So one of the things that we are really looking to do is actually uh, also do that here in the United States. Um, we have a funding a number of couple of grants that are already in on this. Um, you know, and looking at um, actually part of that grant includes Drew University in New Jersey, uh, the theolog theological seminary, because we are, uh, my brother lives there. Um, uh, he's a professor there and he, you know, he's collaborating on uh, creating the academic connection uh, to uh, faith-based organizations. Uh, and so he's already identified 20 faith-based organizations in New Jersey 
uh, that are part of these collaborative network. Uh, and so we can see where a situation where we imagine, you know, having each of these uh, faith-based like churches transformed into access hubs to the C4, uh, where basically you provide the logistical infrastructure for them. Uh, if somebody's sick, they can basically, uh, I mean, they can come through that, you know. And one thing it does is that in doing so, because we have churches in every neighborhood, um, and you know, it can mitigate the digital divide because in that case, um, even people who are, you know, even people who are, you know, don't have connections to broadband or things like that, they can also go to those uh, access hubs and essentially can access the same kind of care that you need. Um, so my end, you know, to end, you know, the, the focus here is really to kind of say, you know, let's collaborate. You know, the key here is really collaboration uh, to, to be able to advance the C4, um, you know, the, the goal of win-win collaborations. Uh, we can be able to address the growing, the growing, uh, growing global cancer burden and the disparities that are there. Um, one thing I would always say is that, you know, uh, one lesson we've learned from the coronavirus is that the future uh, is really technology driven, uh, is digital. And so the C4 provides a platform where we can actually leverage that technology to increase access to care. Um, you know, a lot of these has been published work um, and I uh, just wanna end by acknowledging you know, some of the funding that has been received for this uh, beginning from uh, the Joint Center for Radiation Therapy at Harvard Medical School, a number of foundations and the United States uh, National Institutes of Health. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and give a chance for questions. That's fantastic, Will. Thank you so much. That's really, I know there's going to be some questions. I have a couple questions and uh, I, I wanted to apologize. I didn't mean to rib my friends at University of Pennsylvania earlier. Uh, it was totally out of good uh, goodwill to uh, our collaborators and friends there. Um, but <laughs> So uh, this is recorded, so I wanted to go on the record, but thank you. So let's open it up um, for <laughs> questions before I jump in. Questions or comments? Please take yourself off mute and jump in. Ned. Hi, thank you. Thank you for an amazing seminar. I mean, it, 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 it was you. really it was really enlightening. I'm an immunologist. My lab and clinical trials are focused on immunotherapy, and I was taken by your comment on the NIH grant program yes. yeah. of combined radiation and immunotherapy. Um, Dr. Hafty is here, head of radiation oncology, and we're collaborating on a number of studies. Yeah. What The question that I have is, and we've heard this from Rick and others in the past, is drug accessibility. Yeah. yeah. Small molecule chemotherapeutic agents um, tend to be less expensive, tend not to have uh, shipping issues, refrigeration issues and the like. But when you come, what, I assume what you're talking about is radiation and immune checkpoint inhibitors or antibody drugs. Yeah, exactly, that, yeah. That are extraordinarily expensive even here. Yeah. So could you say a little more about how one gets around that? Do you find the companies very anxious to help you or yeah. <laughs> what, what's the practicality of being able to do those studies or not only studies, but you know, normal care. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, that's a great question. In fact, um, you know, one of the you know, with one of the things we are really trying to address is the fact that I mean, immunotherapy is so expensive that you know, we almost say uh, in Africa there is no hope for that, right? So people don't have hope for access for that. But what uh, I would love to give another talk about this. So the the, the grant that we had. Um, that NIH is funding, it's really focused on, we've developed this, so my lab, which is kind of transitioning into more of the clinical trials, uh, we developed this technology, it's called, um, you know, smart biomaterial drones, that basically we can load very small amount of immune or drug into it. Uh, if you think about it, like Amazon developing a drone to deliver a package at your door, um, you give it a zip code and it goes there. So we've developed this. And so, as you know, with chemotherapy, 
you know, only about, if you administer it systemically, only about three to 5% maximum will get to the tumor itself. The rest goes all over your body and all of that. Um, so in this case, if you use these uh, drones, if you imagine, if you bear with me for a moment there, and they can, you can, you only need to load a small amount of the drug. Um, and then as long as your targeting is correct, the zip code you give is correct. Uh, it can deliver that drug precisely to your cancer. Um, and so you don't need a lot of the drug components. And so in the study we've done, we've used um, antibodies, like you said, very, very rightfully, we used antibodies, an antibody called anti-CD40. It's already a generic. Uh, and so we've actually developed, I've developed that myself in my lab uh, at Harvard. And now we've reached a point where, you know, it's in, uh, it's actually CMC now. So manufacturing that, you know, in, in scale. Uh, but it actually allows us, we can load um, in each of these drone, just 20 microgram, uh, you know, amounts there. And it can deliver that, you know, precisely to the cancer. Uh, it's a low cost technology. It's about $600 uh, to load all of that into, to get all of that done. And so we partner with a company, it's actually in New Jersey, it's called NanoCan Therapeutics. And so, you know, they are driving some of this clinical translation. And when they license the technology, they actually uh, have a carve out, you know, to make sure that, you know, it's accessible. Um, I can tell you the story of why that had to happen. We had to do that, um, but <laughs> it's a long story how we did that. So, um, so you know, so we've, we've been able to do that. So the short answer to your question is that, yes, it's a really important question to ask about, you know, how do you get these companies or immun to provide these immunotherapies? Uh, so we've started in this particular a formulation to look at generics that can be, you know, easily used in lower middle income countries. This antigen presenting, uh, this anti-CD40 helps uh, upstream before you even get to checkpoint inhibitors. So what it does is when you eradicate the cancer, it releases these antigens, um, you know, that are very unique to the cancer. And then uh, the antigen presenting cells, part of your immune system can infiltrate uh, and pick up those antigens. And what this anti-CD40 does is that it, it really helps um, prime, you know, these antigen presenting cells. And so they can go to your lymph nodes, cross present that, you know, to your T cells, and then the T cells can be more specific in attacking the cancer. So, and then the question becomes the downstream, right? So actually we talked to um, um, Merck the other day and they're interested for the United States to look at how, you know, they can fund a phase two trial where they are combining that with the checkpoint inhibitor because it's so it's very effective. So far, we've seen it very, very high, but we expect that there's that synergy downstream with immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors because once the T cells are activated and they're attacking the cancer, you don't, you wanna release the bricks. You know, you don't want to have those checkpoint inhibitors there. Um, but we've really, we have data now, uh, you know, I, I don't have it here, but I can show you. You have data now for prostate cancer, breast cancer, cervical cancer. So we kind of started with this top cancers that obviously kill in the United States, but are also the top killers uh, in lower mid-income countries. And, and so we've had FDA, FDA now and has, you know, it's about to approve this trial. We've gotten the funding uh, from NIH, um, $2.4 million uh, notes of intent to fund this now to start this more decent clinical trials from the fall. So, um, you know, we hopefully can work. And I think, you know, when you highlight, you know, with, um, Professor Hafti, you know, kind of thinking about collaborations between immunotherapy and, and radiation. That's, that's, you know, it just beats my heart because I think there's a really great pathway there um, that kind of cross disciplinary collaboration uh, to address some of these disparities. Um, so. Thank you. And, uh, uh, hi, uh, Bruce Hafti here. So um, could you speak a little bit to, you, you know, the, I guess the barrier of the actual technology availability in these countries. I mean, the yeah. concepts are great that you have. And obviously yeah. we're just beginning to explore those even here in the, in the States, but yeah. but uh, you have the additional barrier of uh, just people having access to technology, the radiation facility. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things we've had to deal with um, with the Lancet Commission for Sub-Saharan Africa, um, it's really, to your question, you know, these infrastructure barriers. Um, I mean, in radiation therapy, like I said, in Cameroon, where I was born, um, you know, we have one functional radiation therapy machine um, at Hopkins, you know, I mean, you know, or Harvard or Rutgers, I'm sure, you know, you have many that, you probably have enough radiation therapy machines than, 
than you know half of African countries. I'm telling you because some countries don't have any, you know, and so uh, that's a huge problem. Um, and so the, the the Lancet Commission will actually plan to right now. The plan is to launch that in with African because unfortunately in African and low middle income middle income countries they usually have um, is a government that drive some of these investments into hospitals. You know, if it's a machine like radiation therapy machine that costs up to $4 million, you know, um, then the government has to invest into that. Otherwise the, the country doesn't have it. Um, so that's one barrier. I mean, you're right. I mean, that's one of the infrastructure barrier that, so we're gonna be launching this commission report with African government leaders, you know, ministers of health and, and presidents really saying, look, actually it's cost effective for you. If you make this investment, this is how much is going to benefit you down down the line, um, and then in terms of the pathology, yeah, that's 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 really um, the diagnostics. You know, um, it's really sad because actually when we look when we're doing this Lancet Commission, looking at cancer registries, just looking at the pathology, you know, uh, how much how many it's very difficult to estimate the true. Um, you know, level of cancer incidence in these low and middle income countries. Basically, we had to make estimates working with the, the IARC, you know, make estimates because some countries don't have, you know, this pathology or, you know, cancer registries, you know. And so um, we think that with the new technologies, uh, like the one I highlighted, um, there's now an increasing movement to kind of see how we can adopt those kind of a low cost uh, technologies, point of care technology infrastructure. Uh, in the lower middle income countries, which can then help us, you know, not just in the diagnosis, but can actually allow us to also have, um, you know, data, you know, <laughs> data that we can even use for additional research, informing policymakers and things like that. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a big deal in terms of that. And, and you know, so I think there's really need, uh, as we think about this, even information and communication technologies, we have to first make that minimal investment in infrastructure. Uh, to make sure that this can then happen. Uh, but in the hypofractionation case, we are very excited about that because um, we can really see an impact. Like, you know, if you go to a country that has one machine and everybody are com is coming from around the country, you know, to treat, to get treated there, and they, they stay for weeks just to get on that one machine, you know. So think about the fact that you can reduce the time, that waiting time, you know, for one person, you can treat five. Um, that for us is actually the biggest benefit of this. Is not the cost I also a benefit. You know, we, we did the estimates, but um, you know, the biggest one is that increased access. Um, and and then when I was talking to somebody here at Hopkins, they told me that you know, he showed me some data that's published recently showing that it's the same thing in the United States. Actually, they are recommending HFRT to address disparities because transportation barriers are an issue for low resource settings here. Right, people may not be able to go to the cancer center just because they don't have uh, up to the 35 times just because they don't have transportation. Um, and so, being able to reduce that can really help facilitate, um, you know, increased access. Um, hi, I just wanted to tell you that was a fantastic talk, and I really, really enjoyed it. And I commend you for all the great work you've been doing so far. It's actually amazing. And Thank you. Yeah. You know, very humble, actually, to see how much you can do for yeah. low low income countries um, that definitely need um, the help. Um, you know, so yeah. uh, trying to just sort of um, extending the question that Dr. Hafti asked in terms of technology. Now, you mentioned, um, you know, obviously, like pathology is the biggest, one of the biggest tools we, we use in, in oncology. Mm -hmm. And I know just from speaking to people, like when I go to ACR and, and, and yep. you know, places and we, and we meet, and I've spoken to people from Nigeria, for instance, yeah. um, where pathology and getting, you know, the just basic biomarkers for, um, you know, breast cancer, you know, to yeah. help treatment and, and her research and, and how, you know, it's not universal and how, how tough that is. And I was running, was looking at, you know, the, the data you were showing with the digitization of, of slides and mm -hmm. I think for, mm -hmm. for pap smears. Is yeah. there anything like that or something to help for pathology and make it sort of consistent across, like for breast cancer, for instance, and where just basic biomarkers from, you know, immunohistochemistry is what guides treatment? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that you, you put your finger right there. I mean, I think um, so. Yeah, for this cervical cancer one, um, you know, that we did, you know, with this uh, remote, you know, you can get these slides. Uh, yeah, so that's one of the things. The next steps kind of scale that uh, approach. So this was done in Kenya, but now the, the next thing will be to kind of look at other countries like Nigeria and other countries to see whether you can, you know. So some, the implementation research really means that in this case, even though we've done it in Kenya. Uh, it doesn't mean that it applies directly. Course, yeah. yeah, we're going to have to do some, you know, some some tests, you know, pilot studies to show that it can work there as well. Uh, for breast cancer, uh, that's one of the lead after cervical cancer in Africa. That's the next one. I mean, breast cancer is a top killer, um, and so you know, and and we know that uh, what you just said. So one of the things that um, has happened during this coronavirus is that you know governments have actually been forced. You know to invest into diagnostic facilities in these countries and so now we have actually this really great opportunity um you know to collaborate to create this kind of using this information and communication technologies to create these kind of collaborations where experts like you or other people who are in the united states can actually have access have facilities locally that you can work with so they can get that basic data that you need uh to be able to then go in there and help um with the biomarkers research, for example. Um, one experience that we've done using uh, these C4 technologies in Tanzania was, was more in the downstaging the cancer. So we basically did a study where we had two villages, village regions. Um, one region we used, um, this, this, is, this is the kind of interventions that have been shown to work really well also in the United States. We just use, inform use their mobile phones. We send them reminders to do breast self exams, um, you know, and they do that over a sustained period of time. And then we compare that because we only have one center at that time in, in Tanzania, the Ocean Road Cancer Center. So and then we compare the patients who are coming from these two regions with cancer. What is the stage of their presentation over time? And what we saw was dramatic. Like you actually see in the region where you have this intervention, where you're providing these um, you know, information and communication technology uh, approaches. Patients present early, basically downstage the cancer from stage four significantly to stage one and two, which is treatable. Um, whereas in other regions that did not have that intervention, you see a clear difference where, you know, they are always presenting late with a disease. Um, and so that then also provides another example where you can scale that in kind of intervention. Um, a lot of it, you can see the barriers, education, uh, cultural, lack of that infrastructure that you mentioned, you know, do they have the basic laboratories that uh, they can actually do some of these tests, um, which are also, you know, really important if we're going to have collaborations in global health, you have to have a starting point, you know, um, so, uh, you know, so we're really, we're really looking forward to seeing how, you know, some of these technologies can be leveraged, you know, to, to, to grow this kind of, uh, you know, uh, approaches. Okay, thank you. Well, for a great talk. Um, uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, the supports for after the initial training, like you mentioned, the one that you did with um, Aortic and um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the European Society. Just you demonstrated a clear need for it, um, yeah. but what comes next after this <laughs> like one and two training and, and how how is that like really sustained and supported? Thinking, thinking along the lines of implementation science also. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's opportunity. Actually, I really, you know, I think there's opportunity for doing more implementation science around that um, to see how that can be scaled as well. Uh, but what we've done in the past now, so we actually have an upcoming course again, uh, starting April 30th. We're now integrating that into the bigger, uh, into a larger program. So the first one that I actually showed you in that data for the contouring was really just for treatment planning. So now we actually have a program starting in April 30th that's going to be from consult all the way to treatment and even follow up uh, using these technologies. And so, uh, so we 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 are now uh, continuing to offer that program in collaboration with Aortic, but then uh, increasing some additional components to that. Uh, you know, as to sustainability, right? So sustainability require that we really have. Um, you know, more people adopting that. So training the trainers, for example, training people locally who can then, you know, also go ahead and train the next generation of people in their hospitals. Um, and, but also providing that continuous support for them. And increasingly people are beginning to realize that that's the case. 
actually tomorrow this night i have to get up at 2 a.m to, to do the same thing in kenya they have a set, they have a program that i have to kind of provide a kind of support uh but the time difference because it's a seven hour time difference i have to get up at 2 a.m uh, but it's fun i mean you're having you're having some impact there um but you know there's a lot of open opportunities for implementation research there you know uh to kind of look at how you can scale that and have it adopted like even with the hyperfractionated radiation therapy that's the big deal you know we know that you know over years now these have been well established in clinical trial evidence-based so why are people not adopting them why what's the barrier that was a great great talk do we have time for one more question yeah please i've been waiting for you tina Okay. So, um, you know, I, I know early on you touched upon also, you know, just with things kind of moving to a lot of virtual format that there's opportunities for, you know, people from around the world to volunteer and provide expertise. Yeah. Um, you know, one question I always have, is like, for folks that want to, you know, volunteer time and, and you know, and help kind of improve, you know, the knowledge base where, where necessary, um, you know, do you find you have to train people, you know, in some level to understand what's available and what, you know, um, you know, what some of the barriers are so that if they're doing a, you know, a consult or a tumor board that they can kind of weigh in appropriately? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's really, <laughs> uh, so far we haven't really had to do that. Uh, we've kind of had, um, you know, the experts essentially, um, you know, at the beginning of it, just tell them the background of the people that they're going to be training. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, if they are, uh, there's a need for language barriers, things like that. We've helped with translation and stuff like that in preparation. Um, you know, but it, you raise a very important point. Sometimes there are these cultural barriers, you know, or just barriers in terms of, you know, we've seen that during the COVID period more was, you know, some people didn't know how to use the technology. You have really great experts. Um, you know, like you saw with teleoncology right now, and people are like adopting it, but there were, there's always this barrier of uh, oncologists who are really great, but they don't want to use the technology. And so what we've had to do sometimes is actually create time to train people to use the technology, like the platform, the Zoom, uh, you know, how do you use these contouring tools or these treatment planning tools that you're going to be using? Uh, so we've had to do that um, in that respect, you know, to kind of help them use the training them to be able to use the technology rather than, um, but I think your point, you know, um, cultural barriers, we, we know that that can be a problem in global health. Sometimes people, you know, just even there, I'm talking to a guy in California, he's the one who wrote the NCCN guidelines for prostate cancer radiation therapy, uh, Roche, Mark Roche. And I realized that he's getting into global health, he's excited, he's tenured professor, he's done, he's retiring, he wants to help. But then I realized that his mindset needs to change a little bit because uh, he needs to be trained a little bit about how global health works. It's not you saying, okay, I'm the best in the world. I'm coming to you. I'm just going to tell you what to do. Um, you know, you have to be humble. Um, you have to be humble because sometimes when you come to this resource, you can, you can, really, you can really backfire if you're not trained that way. You know? So yeah, you make a very important point. Too. I'm wondering, Will, do you find that um people are able to, because we can't bill for hours, providers can't bill for treatment planning and tumor board meetings um, mm -hmm. without their own patients, but are people able to support this through service or teaching effort? What yeah. seems to be, yeah. or is it just purely volunteer? What seems to be yeah. the norm? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what we've been struggling around, especially in some departments which don't see a professional career path in global health. So one thing we do is, yeah, so we definitely try to create some, um, some, some, some win in it. Like, you know, you get an invited talk, so that can go on your CV for sure. We get CMEs, we give CMEs, we give certificates of training uh, for these things so that people can really go away with something um, you know, and then they, they enjoy doing it as well. Besides that, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> no, I love it. The win-win. It's a great win-win. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Will. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, we can keep going, but I think we should wrap up because uh, we're at time. Um, I know people will have other questions, but I'd be remiss uh, in the shadow of, uh, the death of Paul Farmer, my friend, and all of our friends, the 
really humankind's friend, I'd be remiss to not say, you know, we shouldn't use the word never when we talk about access to checkpoint inhibitors or the, enough yeah, radiation yeah. Uh, machines. Uh, uh, it's just a matter of uh, when, and that's what we're, we're striving for. Yes, there may be mountains beyond mountains, but uh, in cancer care especially, but I think the global health um, that he taught us is that um, we have to make things possible and the best possible care is our goal. And um, yeah. so I just wanted to bring that up uh, yeah. in yeah. this time of uh, the, sh the shadow of really his untimely passing. But thank you so much, Will. Um, thanks everybody for attending. And um, we'll talk to you and thank you again. Thank you. Great thank you very much for having me. Appreciate yes. it. Right. Yes. Thank you.